Let's pray, and we'll uh, go ahead and get started. Lord, we thank You again as we reflect upon uh, the challenging issue of abortion, but also today we want to uh, in some ways turn our focus towards uh, the light of the Gospel as well, and how Your truth delivers us from any kind of sin, even the darkest of sins, and that um, we reflect upon today uh, ways in which we can intercede on behalf of the unborn. We pray, uh, Lord, that um, our hearts will be edified and that we'll be motivated to act, each one of us in our own way, called by you. I thank you for the privilege of serving this church during this time. Thank you for walking through us through this difficult subject and being with us as we think about it and reflect on it. Thank you for this in Jesus' name. Amen. So, the, uh, some of the material that we covered, most of you, I think, have been here. So, again, it's on the website. We, in the last few weeks, two weeks, we laid down foundations, uh, image of God, the um, life beginning from conception, the continuum of human identity, if you remember that, um, Prohibitions against unlawful killing. The restrictions that the Bible seems to put upon the taking of human life, particularly when it comes to individuals. And then last week I shared with you some of the archaeology that's been discovered from the practice of Old Testament child sacrifice. How the Canaanite culture spread across the Mediterranean but took this terrible, horrible uh, practice with them all the way to North Africa and to Sicily, and um, how the archaeological evidence uh, shows that this practice really went on in the Canaanite culture and that the biblical references are historical in their historical context, so it shows the accuracy of the scriptures. And so I thought today I would just bring together some parallels between, there are some differences obviously when you think about these two horrible things, but there are a lot of parallels as well. And so, um, I would thought I would just bring them together in a sort of a concrete way. In some of my conversations with some of you, you you've already brought out the obvious, you made the obvious connections uh, between these uh, two things, but um, I thought I would sort of bring them together and show you uh, in a more concrete way some of these parallels. If you'll remember the, of course, last week was Sanctity of Human Life Day, and if you'll remember these sites all across the Mediterranean, as I mentioned, where these child sacrifice rituals took place and the remains of these children have been discovered uh, all throughout this part of the Mediterranean. And then you'll remember this image also that I shared with you that has really burned into my heart. Uh, Here's a picture of this priest taking this baby to the sacrificial altar. And just a reminder to us of the grim nature of this, but also uh, this is in effect what's happening today. The particulars are a little different, but it's the same thing. And it just move our hearts to, to pray about this. So here's some, some parallels. Um, really, in the inscriptions that have been found at Carthage in North Africa, and remember, when I use the word Carthage, it's Canaanite culture that's gone across the Mediterranean. Um, in the inscriptions, it's clear that the, the, the individual giving the child over for a sacrifice, they want something in return. So they're giving away this child in return for something that they desire um, to the god or the deity, the two deities, Baal, Hammam, and Ashtar, Tanit, Ashtar. So... Uh, sometimes there was a crisis going on in their life, or they wanted to fulfill some kind of vow. They made a vow to this God, and now they, want, they have to fulfill this vow by, by giving up their child. And so uh, these are in the uh, inscriptions, very clear. And here's an example, or excuse me, I'm sorry, I got ahead of myself. Um, clearly, we understand the parallel in modern time. Typically, a, y uh, a young woman gets pregnant, an uh, unplanned pregnancy, and it creates a crisis. And there's an exchange that takes place. If a, if a young woman decides to have an abortion, they're exchanging 
the child for something. And those things seem obvious to us. Uh, and we'll talk about those in a moment. But there's an exchange that goes on. So there's something, I want something else. I don't want this. I want this child. I want something different. Same principle taking place. There's fear involved. There's a crisis involved in uh, that governs this decision. Or, worst case scenario, uh, for some people, it's just an intrusion upon their self-serving lifestyle and an obstacle in the way of the road to success. I remember a number of years ago, there was this rather gruesome article in the New York Times about this couple that lived in a rich apartment in New York City. And the woman was very well-to-do, had a very well-to-do career, and found out she was pregnant, and found out that they had twins. And decided to keep one and terminate the other. This was a big story in the New York Times. And it's just so disturbing to read the article, this poor woman and her husband coming under this kind of deception. Uh, but the, the logic, the moral logic of that whole transaction was so disturbing. Um, but it was an exchange, wasn't it? It was, I don't, I can't, I, I can't take care of two kids, but I'll take care of one. And so there's, I, I'll exchange this child for whatever career or whatever it was that the woman felt was more important. Um, very disturbing. But really the same principle. Really no different than what someone was doing in antiquity in terms of sacrificing the child to the God. And so, and it appears it looks like from some of the inscriptions, it's not 100% clear that socioeconomic concerns were part of uh, motivations at Carthage. You know, people just didn't have you know, money and they couldn't, oh, I can't have another child, so I'll, I'll give it over to the priest. Um, and so uh, that was a clear, seems to be a clear motivation as well. There's also this very <laughs> troubling uh, report from this first century historian who not only that this happened on an individual basis, but it was a corporate thing. Apparently the Carthaginians came under the threat of the king of Syracuse. Syracuse is on the island of Sicily. You saw on the map that I showed you before. Sicily is not far from North Africa. And um, uh, there was some kind of misfortune. There was an attack that came upon them, and they thought, oh, you know, we have, we've angered the gods. And so um, they, according to uh, Diodorus Siculus, they selected 200 children and sacrificed them publicly to avert further disaster from what the king of Syracuse was doing to Carthage. Now that's so disturbing. But what I found out in some further research is that other, a couple other historians record, and we don't know if this is exactly true or not, that some of the, the, that the demands were being put on the rich people in the society to give up their very best children, and they were going around to find orphans to try to substitute for their kids because they didn't want to give them up. So, really crazy, demonic kind of stuff. Um, but here we have historians recording this uh, for, for us to, to study and to, to be preserved uh, again. So this is a, it's more of a corporate type of thing, a societal decision. Uh, I would imagine the government would have had to have been involved with this kind of thing to authorize this and to sort of push this along. Imagine the social pressure that was involved with this uh, because of their beliefs in these uh, gods and the effect that these gods had on the way that they lived. And so here's a typical example of an exchange to Tanit, the face of Baal, to our Lord that which was vowed because he, meaning the God, heard his voice, the person sacrificing the child, and blessed him. And this is very typical of inscriptions found at Carthage. So I thought we'd return for a moment and sort of plug in the, um, what we would think about today. How people are deceived and drawn into... Um, terminating the life of their child. What, what are the motivations? When we look at this, we say, well, these are deities, you know, idols of Canaan 
is what the text says in Psalm 106. Idols, things that we worship, things that are exalted above God. And we think of, ah, you know, those crazy people in the ancient world, they, they worship these gods. But we know there's counterfeit gods in our own culture. And they're not, you know, in temples made by hands, but they're real tangible things that all of us are susceptible to worshiping. And particularly if we don't walk with the Lord, we know um, these idols can grab hold of us materialism, sex, power, and so forth and so on. But let's just substitute in possible things that could motivate somebody, an idol that can motivate a person to terminate the life of their child, to give it over, if you will. To the idols of sexual liberation, right? We know from the 1960s, culturally, uh, there was what's called the sexual revolution. Women can become liberated from marriage and from men. And part of the rationale of that is to free themselves from the bonds and the difficulties of having to care for a child. Now, a young woman walking into an abortion clinic isn't necessarily thinking in these kind of concrete terms, but we see culturally how these kind of influences, these philosophical, secular influences have, have influenced people to think this way, that I can engage in sexual activity, get pregnant, and I can free myself of the consequences of that. And this goes for the men too, of course. Um, in fact, instead of liberating men, it's uh, liberating women, it's put them in bondage. Now men can freely just do what they want with women, and they don't have to stay around for the consequences of taking care of a child. Uh, they can simply walk away. And so, this is one of the idols that you can put in to the idols of Canaan. You can read through Psalm 106 and just plug in these different idols. Financial freedom. We talked a little bit about the, the woman and her husband in New York. Not just someone in poverty, but someone who's rich. Career ambition is, would be another one. Even though we know the statistics are typically younger uh, women, typically from uh, poor um, lower class in terms of economic stature. Nonetheless, um, career ambition can be one of the rationales, one of the idols. Avoiding hardship. How often have you heard someone say, maybe on Facebook or on a video or something like that, you know, I, I don't really think I can bring this child into this world because this world's a terrible place. It's a hard place. I don't, I don't want them to endure hardship and I don't want to endure hardship either. That saying is an exchange. I'm going to exchange the child to get this thing that I want over here. And in this case, avoiding hardship. And of course, this puts us on the throne, doesn't it? Avoiding hardship. It puts the person on the throne to determine, you know, what is the chief end of, of, of man is to glorify God, right? But part of God's plan is the difficulties of being in the sinful world. His Son came into the world to endure hardship on our behalf. So, there's something there to that that says, there's a part of it that is, it's natural to want to avoid hardship. We don't, none of us pursue suffering. But to try to remove oneself from it and terminate the life of another person is an entirely different matter. In the modern day, we're not talking about idols that we go and worship and carve. We're really talking about what I call self-serving autonomy. That's the spirit of the age. And it says that man is the ultimate determiner of truth. That man decides who lives and who dies. And that's really what the legal system is saying by allowing this practice to be legal, is to say we have the final authority to take life on our own terms and not on God's terms. And so it really is, on the end, about the exaltation of, hum of human self on the throne. That's what the, bot at the bottom line is. At the very bottom of this is I have the right to take life. I have the right to play God over this helpless, innocent person to exercise godlike power over life and death. That's really, in the end, what it is. 
And this is always what, you know, since the fall, this is the spirit of Antichrist. This is what the battle in the cosmos has been all about, hasn't it? About whether or not God is in charge or whether man and the devil is in charge over life and death. It's part of the terrible deception that came into the garden and we have contended with since then. So, you can plug in any of these notions into the idols of Canaan, into Psalm 106, and you can really see you know, the land was polluted with blood, isn't it? Because of the idols of godlike power over life and death, the land is polluted with blood to the tune of 60 million unborn children. Polluted with blood. It really, really is. That's what this imagery really means, right? Very, very close parallel to what we're seeing today. Now, here's the second parallel. This is not as extensive, but I'm going to try to make the connection. Uh, cultic prostitution was part of Canaanite religion and closely tied to child sacrifice. This is clear from archaeological excavations and, and study of Canaanite religion. Very, Canaanite religion is very perverse. Um, and so there's connection between uh, temple prostitution and child sacrifice. And it's interesting in Leviticus 20, which I read the last couple of weeks, where God forbids giving children over to Molech. You remember, this is the Canaanite God. Um, but if you read through Leviticus 20, the entire context is about sexual immorality. So it's embedded in a context that's talking about sexual immorality, all the different types of things that God forbids in terms of, of human sexuality. Uh, adultery, homosexuality, even bestiality, these abhorrent practices that the Canaanites uh, uh, took, um, participated in, that God forbids the Israelites, part of God's moral law. And so it's very interesting to see how this command is embedded right in the middle of that. Now, we're not talking about prostitution here when we're talking about um, uh, modern day, but what we are talking about is typically what I'm focused on here in this in terms of men, and I already said this, but I'm going to repeat it, is now men, and we focus often on the, the young woman typically who is terminating the life of their baby, but the men now can victimize women in a much greater way. Like they would go to the, to the temple prostitute and, you know, commit this act, and often uh, they'd get pregnant and then the child would be sacrificed in a similar way so the man could just go do what they want. In the culture we've created, the man can do what he wants and then he could be freed from the consequences of it. So as, a, as far as a ma being a man goes, you know, like I'm standing up here, we're talking about something that mostly in, affects women in terms of the act itself, but Men are equally guilty and culpable in this because the culture that's been created allows for this and gives them the freedom, quote-unquote, to really victimize women. They are not liberated at all, but enslaved to the desires of men. And so there's a little bit of a parallel there. It's a little loose parallel, but I hope you get the idea. Number three, uh, some scholars have noted evidence they, they believe that, that child sacrifice was motivated by population control. Carthage, if you remember from the map there, it sort of juts out into the Mediterranean Sea. Um, scholars have looked at the, uh, what they think the population was there. Over a quarter of a million people, probably overpopulated. And it's possible that uh, this took place to try to reduce the population uh, of Carthage, just for practical reasons, uh, food, resources, and so on. And of course, we know, in particular in China, um, uh, communist, the Communist Party imposes great social and economic pressure upon people not to have children, and if they get pregnant, to have abortions. And uh, from the statistics that I've read online, the number in China far out, uh, exceeds what well, the numbers are in America. Close to 400 million is what some of the estimates are in China. So the problem is even worse in the world at large. But the idea of population control is, again, 
Here we have man exalting himself to God-like status, right? Man is the ultimate authority. He gets to control the population as if, as if God, when He created the world, uh, didn't know how many people were going to live on it and how much land was required for man to live properly and comfortably. Man, instead, man has to be in control of that. Well, there's too much population, so we have to get rid of people. Uh, very disturbing parallel. Now here's one that really is going to, I believe, strike our hearts in a personal way. It's clear from inscriptions that if a, if a couple had a handicapped child, that they would exchange that child with the hopes of getting a healthy one. And so, in one inscription, a man, his name is Tuscus, he gave a ch- uh, Baal, his son, his mute son, whose name was Bodistart, and the inscription says, a defective child in exchange for a healthy one. Now all of us sitting here have heard stories and know people and know the pressure that the medical community puts on people when they find out that the child has a physical or mental handicap in the womb and pressure people to terminate the pregnancy. We know Uh, this is common. All of us have heard about this, experienced it, and here we have an example from Carthage, the same thing. An exchange. I'm not... I want what I want. So I want to exchange this child for a healthy one, because that's what I want. I get to play God. Now, in in the transaction at Carthage... The, there's, a, there's, a fake, there's a false god that's involved in the transaction, but in the end, it's the same thing, isn't it? You know, we've removed the false god, and now it's, it's, it's just autonomy that's operating there. Instead of seeing the wondrous beauty of what God has created, even though there's medical issues, there's a beauty and a gift that's given that's destroyed instead. And so, to raise a defective child is not expected of the parents since they can exchange a frail one and have a healthy one for the future. So, a very obvious and grim parallel as well. So, one of the most interesting uh, things that I discovered in my research is that despite this barbaric practice, the Carthaginians, and remember they were what we called in the scholarly literature the Phoenicians, who are the Canaanites. They were not uh, barbaric in the sense of subhuman vermin people. They were actually a very advanced, intelligent civilization. They developed maritime trade all across the Mediterranean Sea. They, a lot of people haven't heard of the Carthaginian Empire because of the Romans and the Greeks. But it actually was a very extensive and very impressive empire. And the parallel here, unmistakably, is here we have in America the post-World War II United States, the superpower, the great economic and military power in the world, legalizes in 1973 the practice of abortion. At, a, at, at really maybe at the height of its civilization, decides to make this legal. And in the same way, this is what at, at Carthage. So you look at the Carthaginians, they're, a, they're an enigma. They're an enigma. They are this advanced civilization that commits this barbaric act. And are we not the same as American citizens? Um, and here we have a couple of quotes from a couple of scholars reflecting on what I'm saying here. Here's this... Harvard scholar who's done extensive research on this, it's impossible to deal with the subject at any length without coming to terms with the human dimension. How could a culture so well developed morally, intellectually, and materially tolerate such an abominable custom? And how could such a sophisticated people sanction what seems to be such a barbaric practice for such a long time? And indeed, it was a long time. At Carthage, seven or eight centuries that this went on according to the archaeological evidence and the historians, how at the most visceral and critical level could human parents bring about the destruction of their own child? And similarly, John Currid says, 
It's interesting to note that all the societies I've studied, primitive cultures, have little evidence of abortion or infanticide. They are primarily the practices of the cultures of higher cultures of antiquity. Seems to me the only difference between our society is we've sanitized the process. We don't offer our children to some idol, we destroy them in a hospital, most orderly and hygienic fashion. Our sacrifices of conven- our convenience without any facade of religious motivation. So Dr. Curd is an evangelical and he uh, participated in the excavations at Carthage. So he was really deeply impacted by um, being involved in these excavations. And really, you can tell in his writing that it really influenced him uh, very deeply in his reflection about it. So the idea of, and he he goes on to say, in truth, we are merely unmasked Carthaginians, meaning American culture. And so, as we think about these parallels, probably some of them were obvious to to you, maybe some of them not, Um, but we think about, as we reflect upon this, about that I mentioned before, that same spirit, that same enemy, that anti-life enemy that's been there since the fall, that God is in contention with. And that we are in contention at war, spiritual war with. It's been, it's been there. He's been there. The Spirit has been there from the beginning. And we can see from the archaeology and what I've laid out here, the historical evidence, that the same, the particulars have changed, but the battle is the same. Right? The prologue to John's Gospel says that, uh, introduces Jesus as the, as the Son, Right? It introduces his, him as the one who is, gives light and life. He is quintessential light and life. And the enemy is death. This cult of death. In the ancient world, and the cult of death repackaged in the modern world. And so, our job as the church, I believe, to oppose this cult of death um, is important and it is incumbent upon us to find ways as we are led by the Lord in grace and in truth to um, participate in this battle, if you will. Not a battle fought with swords, but a spiritual battle. Here we have this other image that I found in uh, my research, again, of this priest and you can see he's got this hat on. So to me, I call it a priest. We don't know from the literature if he's actually a priest, but that's what I call him. And this little baby that he's holding here, ready to be sacrificed in the fires at Carthage. A very grim picture. So what shall we do? What shall we do? Uh, let's do something. And let's do something that brings the light of the Gospel. What are some practical things that we can think about in terms of how we can change the church, ourselves, and the culture? Our first job is ourselves and the church, of course. The church is an eternal institution. The culture, the country we live in, is temporal. It's temporary. But God has placed us here in His providential care. And we live in a particular society at a particular time with particular people that are around us, that are perishing, that are falling into this terrible trap, this terrible belief that they can destroy the very innocent life um, living in the womb. The first is, I don't think that indifference is a moral option for the church, the church at large, for each one of us. It's just an example here is from Leviticus 20. The parallel is not exactly the same. And I'm not suggesting that if anyone is indifferent, that God will turn His face away from them. But in Israel, if someone sacrificed their child to Molech, God says that that's exactly what you do to the ones who stand by and do nothing. Now, I'm not suggesting, again, that He'll do that to us. But what I am suggesting, it was so important to God that people around act. And I think that's the principle that should come out of this for us. We must act. 
How can we act? Well, we first should pray for ourselves, for our church, and for the church at large to ground its moral convictions in Scripture. And that's why in the first session that I laid out the certain foundation from the biblical text to give us a certain place to begin with so that we always go back to Scripture as the ultimate authority in terms of informing us how we look at this issue. And we often find that a brethren, professing brethren in the church justify this practice. And I've had many dialogues with people that are professing Christians that rationalize that this is okay. And it can be very frustrating. God has taught me to be patient and long-suffering with my fellow brethren. It can be difficult, but we must do it if God brings us to a place of having that conversation with someone who claims they follow the Lord. And of course, we can support our local pregnancy support center. At BBC, we support, of course, Bright Hope. And last week we had a wonderful presentation here by Suzanne that I just thought was fantastic. And we should continue to do everything we can to support the ministry of Bright Hope. Don't forget the baby bottle campaign, right? Each year we do this at BBC out in the lobby. Most of you have seen that based on Suzanne's presentation last week. Uh, But let's be praying for them. Here's where we can make a real difference. Every young woman and young man guided in the right direction to choose life for their child is a victory. It's a spiritual victory. And we should join uh, in that fight, as it were. Um, Each and every day, just 30 seconds praying for the women that do the work at this ministry. And we can pray for the laws to be changed. Now, this can be a controversial subject, Because often it is argued that the church shouldn't have anything to do with civil government or politics. Now, I'm not going to be political, but I am going to talk a little bit about the relationship between the church and the state. The members of the church can advocate civil laws in a society that are consistent with the moral law of God. One of the great Phenomenal examples of this is William Wilberforce in England in the early 1800s advocated his entire life to abolish the slave trade in England. So he was a Christian. He had Christian convictions. He saw the slave trade as being deeply immoral based on his convictions of what the Bible teaches. And he influenced the parliament. At the end of his life, the law was changed and the slave trade was abolished. No one would look back at that now and say, you know, that's political stuff, Wilberforce. You shouldn't really be concerned. God will take care of that. God will take care of that. Now that, obviously, is illogical reasoning, isn't it? So, we can use the example of Wilberforce to say the same thing. The law is unjust. It is unjust. It does not protect the life of the unborn child. It's what Calvin called an impious decree. And I think it's a great way to describe what it is. So we as the church, fully knowing that the civil government is not the gospel, is not the church, and is not a permanent institution, and will always be flawed and corrupted, that the church is the eternal institution, as long as we bear all that in mind, we can still advocate to change the laws in our society. We can pray for it. We can work, get involved in it, like Wilberforce did, whatever calling God has upon us. But to just say it's part of the secular state and we should just have nothing to do with it, I don't think, don't think is a proper way of thinking. And here's what Calvin's a great example here in terms of his reflection on civil government as it relates to the kind of way that the person in government should think about their office, and with his usual verbose uh, writing, he says as follows, with what conscience will they, meaning the civil magistrate, subscribe impious decrees, 
with that hand which they know has been appointed to write the acts of God. What does he mean? They know in their heart of hearts that they sit in the position of government because God has put them there. And according to Romans 13, they are to be agents of God to commend what is good and to punish evil. That is the purpose of the state. Romans 13 by Paul. In a word, if they remember, they are vice regents of God. What I just described. It behooves them to watch with all care, vigilance, and industry. Basically saying, with all of their being and all of their mind, that they may in themselves exhibit a kind of image of the divine providence. Fascinating. Guardianship, goodness, benevolence, and justice. Wow. Now that's filled with a lot of implications. But the point that Calvin was making is those that are in government and the laws that are put forth should be consistent with the moral law of God. And the more that we can influence our government to have laws that are consistent, the more people will flourish. Our fellow man will be benefited by it. Now, one more counter-argument that often comes is, yeah, but the government doesn't change the heart. And that is true. The Gospel changes the heart. The purpose of the state is not to change the heart. The purpose of the state is to restrain evil and to do what is right. The Gospel changes the heart so the person knows that it's wrong to kill their baby. But the state should not legalize it and allow it to go on unfettered. That's the way I think that we ought to conceive of this idea. Remembering the Gospel changes people, but the law restrains. And when it's oriented properly towards the law of God, it can benefit the church, those in the church, and the culture around us. Ultimately, we want to see people be saved. That is true. But we also want to see them live in a society where they don't live under oppression. It is much more preferable to live in a free society than in North Korea. And so, as the state operates, we should think about and reflect upon these principles. Always bearing in mind the temporal nature of the state as an institution. I hope and I think that that's a good way to think about it. And here's what Calvin himself said uh, about the issue of abortion. Imagine in the 16th century in Europe, uh, this is something that went on. He says, For the fetus, though enclosed in the womb of its mother, is already a human being. It is a monstrous crime to rob it of the life which has not yet begun to enjoy. If it seems more horrible to kill a man in his own house than in a field, because a man's house is his place of his most secure refuge, it ought surely to be deemed more atrocious to destroy a fetus in the womb before it has come to light. This is a commentary on Exodus 21. Very another eloquent way of stating the matter. And so, we think about, as we, as we come down to the end here, we just think about our responsibility as the church as it relates to this issue inter, inter, interpersonally that is, in our own walk with the Lord, um, living a holy life, confessing our sin, not living in hypocrisy, the way that we operate in the church ourselves, as we, as we, as we, uh, in our families, in the church, and as that circle of influence grows, that we can influence the people around us, our extended families, and the culture. We get the work towards getting our church healthy. I'm not suggesting this church isn't healthy, but the idea of getting it right so we can go out and proclaim the truth of God's Word in the culture at large. Not to redeem the culture, but to bring the church to the culture so people are redeemed. And when people are redeemed, the culture will be redeemed. So there's an interplay that goes on with this. And I trust and pray that we... And myself, um, I fear I've not done enough when it comes to this issue. 
The Lord has put this unique kind of presentation in my heart. A number of years ago, I ran across this archaeological evidence and I started putting it together and started thinking, wow, this, this really could maybe make an impact. So this is one way that I can, can contribute. But I think we all can. I was thinking the other day, what if each one of us got up in the morning and 30 seconds, we stopped, we picked one of the 50 states, anyone, and prayed for an unknown, unborn child right now who is about to go be terminated in an abortion clinic and name them, maybe? I, I pray for little Billy today. That God, you would save him from that. And if each one of us in the church did that for 30 seconds, each day, a hundred of us, that'd be a hundred children a day times 365 days a year. Now, we don't know what God will do, but we can ask Him, can't we? And of course, there's other things we can do, more tangible things, but just that, that little prayer to take 30 seconds maybe each day, I want to challenge you to do that. I'm going to challenge myself to do that. To pray for one unnamed, unborn child to be saved. And make that difference. And change. And move our church and our culture away from this cult of death. Now in the end, we have to always remember, and I'll, I'll finish up here, and I'm sorry I'm running a little bit late, that although we've walked through this grim subject for three weeks, that the light of the Gospel is greater and deeper and wider than this sin. And that this is what Jesus came into the world for. To save from the darkest of idolatry and sin. And to deliver men and women from it. And so, that can be, our, as of course, our message when we engage in this, that there is forgiveness available. A forgiveness that is deep and wide and can cleanse any sin. And so that is where we want to bring people who we engage with in this subject. Stirring their heart to know the moral law of God and that it's wrong, but leading them to the Gospel. That they're not condemned if they're in Christ. And that's the glorious message that we have for them and for our culture. So let us pray and we will finish up.